Greetings and welcome back to Gothic Homemaking. In previous episodes, we traveled to London, Seattle, Nashville, New Orleans, all over the world, really. Today, I'm going to return to Los Angeles in search of inspiration. You should totally come, Orville. It'll be so much fun. Suit yourself, Dr. Grumpenstein. Soon I was at Bar Sinister, LA's premier goth club where all the prettiest goths hang out. Chandeliers and wrought iron stairwells, gargoyles and gothic arches. This place really has all of the mandatory gothic details. They even have sacrificial virgins. At least, I think they're virgins. It's kind of hard to tell. I told you to come, dummy. You're really missing out. <laughs> Luckily for me, I'm not alone. I came to see my good friend, Kent Caliber, Bar Sinister's MC and former Amazing Race contestant, and I asked him the hard questions. Uh, what is the one thing that you absolutely feel somebody needs to have, or you need to have, in your home, in your Gothic home? Okay, in, in a Gothic home, Gothic homemaking, the one essential aesthetic ingredient, it's gotta be bats. <laughs> No, bats have been legit gods since the days of Dracula. You heard it here first. Ken Caliber was raised by bats. <laughs> well, let's go have some fun. Let's do it. Cheers. Hey, hey, Orville. Oh, my dark gods. LA was amazing. You should have totally come, fool. <laughs> oh, oh, get Yeti. No, no, Yeti. Get back in the freezer. No, you cannot play in the kitchen. Get back in the freezer. Okay, fine. You can play in the kitchen. But no poopies. No poopies. I never, ever lose my keys. You know why? Because they always go right there in the very same spot, on that little nail. But now that I've talked to Ken Caliber in Los Angeles, I wonder to myself if there isn't somewhere in the world a bat-shaped key holder. Only one way to find out. Let's hit the interwebs. I did a search for bat key holder and shockingly such a thing actually existed. I found this iron one on eBay and the price was right. Well, the cast iron bat key holder arrived and I have to say it's very art deco. Also, this brown iron is not gonna do. We're gonna have to tint this black. Let's go back to the internet and see if we can find something more appropriate for the lair. Shockingly, there was another bat-shaped key holder on the internet, this one by Design Toscano. Now this is more like it. Now this one is vastly more realistic. In fact, it might be too realistic. It looks a little bit more like a Halloween decoration. I would call this brass one high design, and I would call this resin one Halloween. And it's so important when you're decorating your lair to walk that line between high design and to avoid the pitfalls of making your place look like it's decorated with Halloween decorations. For instance, this is high design, and this is Halloween. This is high design, and this is Halloween. This is high design, and well... This is Halloween, this is Halloween. Now the other day, a friend of mine sent me a photo of this. It's a Victorian brass bat sconce for candles. It was being sold by a company called Absinthe Taxidermy in Atlanta, and they had two of them. Only one thing left to say, I'll take them both. Now this is truly the perfect example of walking the line between high design and Halloween. Unfortunately, I don't really think brass is gonna work with the color scheme of the lair, but I think I know how to tint this so it is the right color. I bought some ebony rub and buff, and I rubbed it onto the brass sconces until they were completely black. Then, I dry brushed some pewter rub and buff over that. I buffed them with a rag to bring out the shine, and now they really look like they belong in the lair. Now, I've always been a fan of gargoyles, grotesques, and plaster statuary, and I thought to myself, maybe we could find a little bat gargoyle for the lair while we're at it. Now, I heard rumors of a mystical place in Seattle where you can find exactly that kind of thing. Take a look. As a huge fan of gargoyles and plaster statuary, I have to tell you that I've always dreamed of a place like this existing. They have really every kind of creature you can imagine in there. And the owner, Gail, lovingly tends to them all. 
There were owls and griffins, and I saw a lot of cat sculptures in there. And there was no shortage of skulls. And there were plenty of dragons for you fantasy fans. Now, I came on a mission to find a bat, and eventually I found exactly what I was looking for. Because these bat plaques were made by hand, they varied in shade, but Gail kindly helped me find the one that was perfect for the lair. Back in the lair, I hung that bat in our very bright hallway. The lighting in the lair is pretty harsh, so we're gonna take a break from finding bats for a moment to show you a little something I like to call the Purple Lighting Project. It all started with a trip to the lighting district. There I picked up some of this rope light. Next, with these U-shaped fencing staples, I tacked the rope light along the perimeter of my molding. Back at the lighting district, I bought these diffusers because quite frankly, rope lighting on its own looks like you're in a Spencer Gifts or a dorm room. I tacked them in place with some nails. However, when I turned the rope lights on, I found that the diffusers didn't do much to diffuse the light. So then it was off to the trimmings district. I went to M&J Trimming. They have a huge selection of lace trim. Next, using 3M77, I applied a layer of spray glue to the diffusers. And then I simply glued my lace trim onto the diffusers. Now they look like they're wearing fancy stockings. I was able to pop the diffusers in place. Well, then it was down to the floral district where I bought some artificial ivy. And as you've seen me do before, I dipped it into a gallon of gloss black paint. I squeegeed the paint off of the ivy and I hung it to dry. Lastly, I threaded the ivy onto the very same nails that were holding the diffusers in place. And there you have it, the Purple Lighting Project. And now the lair has a beautiful purple glow. Just look at... Oh. Lillian Todd, Russian Vampire Princess, she's back! Oh, I got this. Yes! Gotcha! <laughs> Take that, Vampire Princess. <laughs> Shouldn't she be turning into her human form? Oh, that's unfortunate. What? No, no, no! Oh, damn it, Yeti! You said you was vegan! <laughs> what a waste! I could have stuffed that bat. We could have used it as decoration. That gives me an idea. I wonder if we can find real taxidermied bats to use as decoration in the lair. And I think maybe New Orleans is just the place to look. Once upon a time, there was a great little shop in New Orleans called Requiem. It was full of all manner of oddities and curiosities. Moreover, it was owned by my friends Chloe and Steven of the band My Parasites. Unfortunately, it closed, although you can still buy from them online. But luckily, the last time I was in New Orleans, I was able to catch them when the store was still open. Hey guys. What's up? Oh, good, good to see you. Just in New Orleans for the day, I figured I'd drop by and look for some bats. you have any bats? You do have a number of bats. How about something with a little more meat on his bones? I've got just the Well, they whipped out their super secret box of udon noodles when I explained to them what I needed the bats for. And in there was exactly what I was looking for. 
Now, I had originally planned to hang this bat from the ceiling, but I just got a better idea. I'll hang it from the chandelier! Well, he looks pretty good up there, but it's going to take more than one bat to make this chandelier look impressive. Luckily, I know a place in Los Angeles where I think I can get many more of these bats. No way, you had your chance, fool! Back in Los Angeles, I hit Necromance on Melrose. This place is basically a natural history shop that sells other unique and curious items. They have t-shirts and taxidermy, skulls and other specimens, old photographs, and other oddities. You get the picture. Now, I came in search of bats, not butterflies. But just past this butterfly case was the treasure trove. Inside of this cabinet were all manner of desiccated bats. Apparently, they did have the hanging bats that I was looking for. And these were quite a bit bigger than the one I had picked up in New Orleans. The staff was kind enough to lend me a ruler, and let me tell you, these bats were a whopping 8 inches long. I bought the four biggest ones they had from a very pretty but very camera shy tattooed lady. Next it was down to Hale Dark Aesthetics in Nashville, Tennessee. Now a couple of years ago when I was playing at the East Room next door, Hale decided to stay open late so that my spooky fans could do some late night macabre shopping. I too visited the shop that night, and I can honestly tell you it's one of the very best taxidermy shops I have seen in all of my travels. Oh, hey guys, how are you? Good okay. to see you. Hey, how are you? Hey, Voltaire, Voltaire, how's it going? I'm in the market for some hanging bats. Do you have anything like that? Of course we do. Right over here. Right, Check them out. Great, let's go. Alright. So what have you got? We have all kinds of hanging bats. So many different shapes. We have some hanging bat skeletons as well. And they are lovely. But I'm I'm in the market for the whole car, not just the chassis. If you know what I mean. I like your style. Yeah. <laughs> you want the creepy eyeballs. Well, this is a nice one. Are these the biggest ones you have? These are the biggest ones we have. I've have seen, seen a handful of bigger ones, and they can get big. Really big. Really? Oh yeah. Any chance you could find me one? It wouldn't be impossible. Okay, well in the meanwhile, I definitely want the two of the two bigger ones that you've got. Cool, we can do that. Not a problem. Excellent. Wrap them up. Cool, them. will do. Well, then it was back to New York City where I visited Evolution. This place feels more like a museum store. It comes across as being more interested in science than it does in oddities. They had this amazing flying fox skeleton, but at $6,000, it was way out of my budget. They did, however, have the hanging bats I was looking for, though they were quite a bit more expensive than anywhere else I'd been. Welcome to New York, folks. The staff was super helpful, and they helped me find all of the prettiest bats for the lair of Voltaire. Well, I am back from my travels and I have amassed quite a bunch of bats. And now, this is what the chandelier looks like. Now, taxidermy is not for everybody. I've actually met some goths who don't want dead things in their lairs. I know, it's pretty weird to me too. But I do believe in providing you with some vegan options. Now, you've already seen some of them, but here are a couple more. Recently, I went to an art opening at a vinyl toy shop called My Plastic Heart. The show was called Where of Hysteria. I'm told that means to wander longingly through a forest in search of mystery. The show seemed to feature artists making pieces that look like taxidermy and other animal specimens, like these skulls and skeletons by Lana Crooks that are made of wool, believe it or not. But it was this piece that stole my heart and my wallet. The name of the piece is Perditus, 
by Caitlin McCormick. She makes these incredible creations out of crocheted string. I'd seen her work before on Instagram where she goes by Mr. Caitlin. Next, I searched Google to see if I could find a fruit bat painting that was making the rounds on social media a while back. I assumed it was in a museum somewhere, but I found it available on the Etsy page of Alexis Trice. This painting is so amazing that I just couldn't resist adding it to our collection of bat-themed art. It's a tremendous honor to be able to own such incredible bat art, but really, what could it be better than having this and real bats in the lair? Oh, that means a lot coming from a corpse. You know what, actually? Why don't you go sit in the corner? Orville, go! That's better. Well, thank you so much for watching Gothic Homemaking. You know, when it comes to decorating your home with bats, I really don't think we could have found anything better than what we've shown on today's... Huh. I wonder who that could be. Joseph D'Angeli, what yeah. brings you to town? I just happened to be cruising by with the bats and your place came up as a bat-friendly rest stop on the GPS. Well, we're all raised by bats here. Do you mind if we come in and hang out? No, come on in. Wait, what do you mean bats? I have the live bats with me. Come in, come in. Well, this is a very auspicious occasion here at Gothic Homemaking. Just when we thought we had found every kind of bat you could possibly have in your home, my dear friend, Mr. Joseph D'Angeli has arrived. And is it true you really brought real live bats with you? I did. I always have bats on me, so of you, course. Uh, you always <laughs> you have bats will travel? Have bats will travel. Do, can we see them? Sure. Well, moments later, Joseph returned with a pet carrying case and he lived up to his name as the Batman because out came two of the most beautiful bats I have ever seen in person. Oh, wow, so who's this? This is Louie. This is our old bat. He's one of the oldest of our colony. He is a straw-colored fruit bat, uh, otherwise known as flying fox. They come from Madagascar and parts of Africa. You know, this is a goth show, so it's safe to assume that this is a creature who's gonna fly through your window at night and bite your neck and drink your blood, right? Not. Not at all? No. Bats couldn't be further from what we heard about them growing up. They are quite friendly most of the time. They're very shy animals, they're very reclusive animals, and they actually enjoy spending a lot of time with their own kind. The stories we heard growing up about bats getting tangled in your hair and bats biting you on the neck and bats being aggressive and being nasty and mean couldn't be further from the truth. Okay. He'll take fruit right from your hand right now if you give it to him. Well, That's how friendly I, he is. I have some fruit here. Oh, look at that. Um, let's try one of these. Louie? Fruit bats are amazingly important for the rainforest, as you're going to find out in a few minutes, because they don't swallow solid foods. What the bats do is they chew up their fruit, drink only the juice, and then spit out the seeds in the pits. So it makes for a messy household, but it's great for the rainforest because they help us to regenerate the trees and the plants that we cut down. So they don't fly in your window and drink blood, like we were told in all the horror movies. I mean, at least we have a very good chance of getting rabies though, right? Even that was blown out of proportion. Although bats are mammals and they can contract and transmit rabies, a very, very small percentage of them. You have more of a chance of getting bit by a rabid raccoon, skunk, fox, even our own dogs and cats than you do a rabid bat. The insects, like mosquitoes, that we are dealing with now because of the lack of bats, carry more diseases that are transmitted to people than bats do. And bats eat mosquitoes. Absolutely. Our native bats eat mosquitoes and eat lots of them. So bats are not evil, scary things. They are not. Bats do not fly in through your window and drink your blood. No. Bats enjoy the company of other bats. Very much so. And they're nocturnal and timid. Very much. So in truth, Bats are really actually kind of a lot like goths. They are the true goths, and they share that lifestyle with the gothic culture. So many of the gothic culture relate to bats because they are so similar to people. Just when I thought uh, we couldn't get anything more amazing regarding bats in the lair, real bats, thank you so much to Mr. Joseph D'Angeli. And if you'd like to learn more about bats and how you can help bats, please visit his website. That information is right here.
Wasn't that amazing? Well, I think it's important to note that while Joseph D'Angeli was here, we had a very passionate debate about the ethics of owning that taxidermy, which of course he disagrees with. But our debate was respectful and dignified and will be friends forever. Now, as the host of Gothic Homemaking, I see it as my duty to entertain you and to show you things that are legal and that Goths will more than likely love. But the ethics of it is for you to decide. Now, if you choose to argue about the things that I show on this program, I ask that you follow Joseph and my lead and that you do it with dignity and intelligence and respect and compassion. Because after all, we are all mature adults here. What the hell is that? Oh, oh, hey now, what's going on there? Dark gods, Yeti, I said no. Oh, poopies. This episode was made possible through the generosity of J. Renee Parker, Cadmus Rimbaud, Dr. Casket's Cadaver Corps, and Spellbound in Washington, D.C. Oh, that's great. Oh, oh, <laughs>